Hey everybody, welcome back to my channel. Uh, today I have a topic for you that is of a particular interest of mine because it combines both my passions for strength and size. Today I want to talk about uh, the differences or similarities between training for maximum strength and maximum size and can you combine both to achieve optimal results in, in both objectives. Uh, before we get into the, into the presentation, I want to make sure that you guys understand the importance of subscribing and liking and commenting on the videos because that's actually what will drive the channel and will motivate me to keep producing material. Uh, so one thing I want to mention before we get started, uh, just give me a second, I'm going to change my size here. I'm going to, well, I'm blowing up. Cool. Right. One big thing I want, like super exciting for me to announce that a big shout out to my friend, uh, Andrew, who actually completely changed his physique in four weeks only, simply by subscribing, liking, and commenting uh, on my various uh, videos. He also made sure to hit the bell thingy. Uh, as you can see, this is an amazing result. That makes me so happy because that's actually the reason why I'm putting this channel out and pumping out the, this great information because I want you to get on the game train. Now, what's even more impressive is that Andrew actually achieve those gains without even hitting the gym yet, simply by watching those videos. I can't wait to see what this dude can achieve once he gets to training. That should be very exciting for all of us to see. So Andrew, great job, man. But I honestly can't say that I'm shocked because I've been receiving like tons of emails with stories just like Andrew's commenting on how much muscle they've been gaining simply by liking my video. So if you are like Andrew and you had an amazing transformation just from subscribing and liking, be sure to share that amazing story in the comment section of this video. Now, let's get on to our topic at hand, size versus strength, okay? And many people will automatically assume that uh, training for strength and training for size is, is pretty much the same thing. I mean, bigger dudes will lift heavier weights than smaller dudes most of the time. Uh, and, and so they think that if you train to get stronger, as you lift he heavier and heavier and heavier weights, you should also have uh, significant increases in muscle mass that parallels uh, the amount of strength you're putting on your body. Uh, and also, if you get more muscular, well, you would hope that strength would follow. I mean, a bigger guy and a bigger girl should actually be stronger than a smaller one. And when you look at reality, well, you do tend to see that uh, more muscular people tend to be stronger than smaller individual with less muscle mass. But you also see people who are uh, big, big bodybuilder types, that got big without even lifting big weight. If you've been following bodybuilding for a while, uh, you're probably aware of guys like like Paul Dillett, for example. Paul Dillett was the first mass monster, and the dude was like 6'2", 270 in contest shape. Yet he was renowned for lifting baby weights in training, doing lateral raises with 15, 20 pounds, and not really pushing those big lifts, doing mostly isolation work, machine work for very high reps. And you have many different examples of guys like that who never actually lifted heavy weights but got a great physique to show for it. Uh, if you look at the other point of view, you have plenty of strong individuals that carry lots of muscle. You look at uh, elite powerlifters, uh, they tend to have more muscle mass than people who are not as strong. Yet you also have guys like the guy in the picture called Ruslan Nurudinov, who was Olympic champion in Olympic weightlifting, uh, who could lift way over 500 pounds over his head, yet he looks like an average dude. I mean, you if you saw that guy in the street, you would never think for a second that he could actually lift 200 pounds over his head, much less 500 or more, okay? Uh, so you have evidence on, on both sides of the spectrum. You have example of size and strength going together, but you also have plenty of example of people getting strong without getting like very muscular. And you have people who are very muscular and are not very strong. So what is it? Should you train the same way if you want to maximize strength or maximum size. Now, the one thing I want to tell you is that if you want 
optimal maximum string gains, the, the program you will have to follow will not lead to maximum muscle growth. And vice versa, if you're doing the program that will lead to the maximum amount of hypertrophy, it will also not lead to maximum strength gains. I mean, you will get stronger if you get bigger, and you will get bigger if you get stronger, but if you do everything right to optimize, to maximize one goal, then the other goal will not improve as much. You can also decide to go middle of the road here and progress like moderately well in both gains equally. You also will have an approach that, that I will present in the later portion of this video that I personally believe in, in that you, getting stronger will become a tool that will help you get bigger and vice versa. Building more muscle, even, even if it doesn't lead to great strength gains immediately, can become a tool to help you gain strength in the future. And that's where period periodization comes in, like dividing your trading cycle in several blocks with different goals. But if you want maximum growth, the training program you're going to have to use will not lead to maximum strength. If you want maximum strength, the program you have to use will not lead to maximum hypertrophy, okay? You can combine both by alternating phases of both goals, but achieving both at the same time will not be optimal, okay? So let's look at a few differences when it comes to turning for strength and hypertrophy. For strength, as I mentioned briefly, muscle mass is only one factor that will affect strength, meaning that you can get stronger by increasing muscle mass, but it's not the only thing that will increase to increase strength. Uh, for example, neurological efficiency, how well your nervous system recruits muscle fibers. Uh, how fast can you make those fire, the fiber fa fire? The faster those fibers fire, the more strength you can produce. And that's something that can be developed over time, especially when you use methods using very heavy weight or explosive work. It, we can also improve intra and, intra and intramuscular coordination, basically making those fibers recruited work better together and making the various muscles involved in a movement work better together. And that has nothing to do with uh, building muscle, you can dramatically improve strength simply by focusing on those neurological factors, especially if you have a decent amount of muscle to start with, you will simply improve strength by learning to use those muscles more efficiently. And that explains why you have several dudes who, who, or girls who can lift monster weights, yet they look barely above the average gym rat when it comes to muscle size. It's because they can essentially use almost all the potential strength they have. Whereas you're going to have bodybuilders who never actually train the neurological factors to their limit, and they will never be, be able to lift weights when it comes to maximum lifting that would approach what they should be lifting with their given size. Finally, you can also increase strength by decreasing the protective inhibitions that are, are present in your body as a, 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 a fail switch or a a safety mechanism. For example, the Golgi tendon organs, which are inside those tendons in your muscles, their job is sensing when the body is producing too, too much force for its own safety. Basically, if your biceps is producing so much force that your body feels, you know what, if I produce a bit more, I might tear something apart because structurally speaking, I might not be able to end all that load. So it will stop force production. That's why a, an average person who's not trained can probably only use 30% of his muscle strength potential. Compare that to an elite Olympic lifter like Nurudina, like I, 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 that, that I mentioned earlier, he can probably use 85, 90% of his maximum strength potential. Okay, And by gradually working on inhibiting those Golgi tendon organs, the body will allow you to use gradually more and more and more of your strength potential. So you can dramatically increase your strength without even adding more muscle simply by working on the neurological factors and also by decreasing the protective inhibitions, which is super conservative because the body really doesn't want you to hurt yourself by lifting weights. So it's, it's super conservative. So, so 
as you can see, hypertrophy is not even necessary to get stronger. On the other end of the spectrum, if you look at hypertrophy, neurological efficiency is helpful because if you can recruit more muscle fibers more easily, you can stimulate more growth. And if you can lift heavier weights, you can cause more muscle damage, you can activate mTOR more. So that will actually lead to a greater growth stimulus. So for basically, uh, if you can do the same work, the same program, but with 10, 15, 20% more weight, the growth stimulus should also be magnified, allowing you to grow faster. But again, it's only a tool. Uh, you have plenty of guys who get stronger without getting bigger, as I explained. Now, uh, if you look at some study, I, I, I often quote the study by Cameron and Mitchell, which was conducted at McMaster's University, Go Canada. Uh, they compared three programs. Uh, one of them was using 30% weight uh, for three sets to failure. And the other one was 80% three sets to failure. They had another group doing one set to failure with 80%, which reported uh, smaller gains in, gr in muscle growth. But if you look at the, the, the group doing three sets of uh, to failure with 30% and the one doing three sets to failure with 80%, both for the duration of the study, which was either eight or 10 weeks long, if I can remember correctly, they had the exact same amount of muscle growth. So if you train to failure, the load is actually not that important when it comes to trigger muscle growth because you can trigger growth by many different factors, muscle damage, mTOR activation, growth factor production, lactate production, muscle fatigue. So you can compensate the lack of one by increasing another. Uh, the one thing that the study found, though, is that the group using 30% had half the strength gain gains as those using 80%. Uh, in fact, the group using 30% for three sets to failure had much lower strength gains than even than the group doing only one set at 80%. So as you can see, if your goal is strength, the load you use is important because if you want to improve those neurological factors I mentioned earlier, that is highly correlated with the load you're using, the, the amount of force your muscle uh, must produce. So you will need to go heavy when, it, when you want to get straight, it gets stronger. That might seem pretty easy to understand, yet most people, uh, many people think that if you get bigger, you automatically get stronger. Yes, you increase your strength potential, but if you don't train the neurological factors, you will not be able to use the muscle mass you produce to produce maximum force. Essentially, you, you need to learn to use those muscles under heavy work to become good at heavy work. You become good at what you train, basically. So if we look at general application for strength, now, I'm going to get into uh, like the training parameters, sets, reps, number of exercise, rest intervals, and in a later part of this video. But uh, that's the way I teach. I always start from a very general point of view and gradually work toward the specifics because I want you to come to those conclusions by yourself, okay, and then present my, my own applications. So strength, to build, build strength. There's a difference between building and demonstrating strength. To build strength, to increase strength potential, the best zone to train in is 87 to 92 percent. Okay, uh, that's where you have the best combination of load, tension in the muscles, but also time under tension for a given set. A time under tension, if the muscles need to work for 15, 20, 30 seconds. The, the, the muscle fatigue, the uh, growth factors release, the muscle damage, all of that is much higher than if the time under load is like six, seven, ten seconds. So sets of one, two, or even three reps are not really effective at building maximum muscle growth. I'm not saying you can't build muscle from very low rep, but it's a lot less efficient than slightly higher reps. So if you want to build strength, you want to work on all of the factors involved in strength production. Muscle mass, neurological factors, protective inhibitions. The latter, the latter two require heavier loads. The first one requires uh, long enough duration or enough work in a set to at least get those growth uh, mechanisms activated. So doing sets of one, two, or three reps is not enough to get the maximum growth uh, from a set. 
And, and sure, you can argue that, you know, you can compensate by doing more sets. In fact, I, I recommended that myself years ago. Uh, for example, doing 10 sets of three reps instead of three sets of 10 reps. The problem with that is that doing 10 sets of three reps has a tremendous impact on neurological fatigue, adrenaline production, cortisol. It's much harder to do 10 sets of three with like 92%, 95% than it is three sets of 10 with 70%. The whole overall stress on the body is a lot higher and it's much harder to recover from. So it's not just a matter of looking at the mathematics uh, and saying, oh, you have the same number of reps, it should work the same. There are other factors involved. So to build maximum strength, the zone that will work on all three of the, the factors involved in strength production it is 87 to 90, 92% range. Work above 92% called the maximum effort method is what actually leads to the fastest strength gains. But it's not really building your strength potential. It, it, it's mostly becoming good at demonstrating the strength you have or increasing your capacity to use the potential strength you already have. Because if you go with 95, 97, 100%, the amount of work you can do without having issues with the neurological system is very, very low. Not enough to lead to maximum or at or even significant muscle growth. So you can't really build that, that strength potential. You're only improving neurological and inhibitory factors, and that only allows you to use the muscle you already have better. Okay, so it's great to learn to quickly get a boost in strength, but that will not build your strength potential. You still need to get those muscles bigger to improve that. So the maximum effort method is really interesting for athletes who are already muscular. If you already have the muscle mass required to be strong, then that works. You look at West Side guys, the West Side barbell guys, they are all jacked when they start training winning West Side. So they can actually progress very well. If you look at Olympic weightlifters, well, it's because over the, over the years, they actually build the foundation of muscle that they actually need for their sport. Uh, so if you apply those principles without having the base that they have, you probably will not get stronger as fast as you think, or you will not reach the ceiling you hope to achieve. Now, for strength, a higher frequency per movement pattern will develop strength uh, more uh, faster uh, because you will get faster neurological efficiency progression. Basically, the neurological factors improve faster when you have heavier loading, but also when you are under heavier loading more frequently. Uh, so uh, when it, it comes to strength, there is a benefit to hitting each movement pattern more often. That's why Olympic weightlifter squat, clean, and snatch pretty much every day or like five days a week. Uh, if you look at the, some uh, European powerlifters, they will also do the competition lift three to six days a week. In, uh, so, so there is a benefit when it comes to motor learning, improving muscle fiber recruitment, fiber firing rate, intra and internal intramuscular coordination by doing a movement more often. Okay. For hypertrophy, you will not have that. There will be a limit by uh, as to how as to how frequency can improve your strength. The high demand of the exercises you're using when you you're trying to get stronger. I mean, yes, you can do some minor isolation work, but honestly, if you want to get stronger, you have to put your work in on a big basic lift: your squat, your deadlift, your bench press, your overhead press, your rowing, your chins, and these movements as well as the intensity required, the, the amount of weight you need to lift, increase the demand of the workout so much that there is a limit to how much work you can do without burning yourself out. So because those exercises, the, the methods you, the loading schemes you use, create such a large demand on your body, you are limited in the amount of assistance exercise you can do because you will quickly reach a training stress level and it will be too high for you to recover. Refer back to my first video on the differences between enhanced and natural lifters for a proper explanation of the overall training stress of a workout. To maximize strength, it's best to do more sets of fewer exercises. Because once again, the more sets, the more total reps you can do on a movement pattern, the more you improve those neurological factors. That's why when you train 
in for strength, you don't have a lot of assistance exercises. Of course, there are exceptions. West side is an exception, but most powerlifters, Olympic weightlifters around the world, they stick to the big basics and they do a, a small amount of assistance work only to fix their weakness. Now, you can use low stress hypertrophy work uh, to fix weak links, uh, but be efficient. I mean, don't throw 10,000 assistance exercises to make sure that you hit every single muscle. When you are focusing on those big basic lifts, pretty much every muscle will receive some form of stimulation. Only your weaker, lagging, weak point muscles will require additional work in the form of low stress isolation work. It is very easy to completely kill your progression when training for strength by doing too much assistance work. Now, Uh, sets lower than five reps will not work well for hypertrophy. Uh, because to have an, uh, an effective set when it comes to trigger and growth, you need a, a mix of high enough tension load to create muscle damage or muscle fatigue, uh, but not so high that you cannot do many reps. Because every rep you do, importantly, every eccentric phase, lowering the weight, the, the more it is one opportunity to create muscle damage and trigger mus, uh, uh, muscle growth. So if you only have three reps, you only have three occasions to cause some muscle growth activation. If I have 10 reps, you have a lot more. Now, each rep will be less powerful, but not so much that the, the, the number of reps can compensate. So a maximum hypertrophy, I personally believe in the 6 to 12 rep range. We're going to cover that uh, later in the video. Uh, and certainly lower than 6 uh, can be used if you want some growth while getting a good strength, but it will never be optimal for maximum growth. Yeah, by the way, I know that some of you are thinking, well, the 5 doesn't know what he's talking about. Dude. I will tell, I will talk about various goals, maximum strength, strength and size, maximum size, strength later on. And I will tell, talk to you about those exceptions. There are no significant training each muscle more than twice a week when your goal is maximum hypertrophy. Okay. For strength, there is because the more often you practice a movement, the faster the neurological adaptations will be. When it comes to hypertrophy, uh, there is no benefit while well, you can do a bit more volume, but uh, there is no significant benefit from training a muscle three or four days a week when it comes purely to muscle growth. You might need more exercises when training for hypertrophy because those big compound movements, they might only focus on the dominant muscle in the chain. For example, me when I did bench press uh, or when I do bench press, it's mostly triceps and shoulder. The chest doesn't get anything out of it. So I have to do pectoral exercise to get maximum growth. Similarly, if I do uh, any type of rowing, my traps and rear delt takes most of the stress and my lats don't get mo a lot of stimulation. So I will need some isolation work from the lats. So the, the, the point is, if you want to develop a physique that is that looks like a bodybuilder type, or, or even if it's smaller, I, every muscle is properly developed, you will likely need to use a lot more exercises, which also means you can't Go as heavy on the big movements because that overall training stress will be too high. You can either use an intensiveness or a volume approach for hypertrophy. Again, I talk about it in my second video on the eight recommendations for natural lifters. But don't do both in the same workout. Don't go all out to failure with a high volume in the same session. The, that will lead to an excessive training stress that most people can't recover from. Either do one, going to failure, going all out with low volume, or go volume, high volume, but stopping a few reps short of failure. That will allow you to recover properly. Now, that was a lot longer than I expected. I'm sorry about that. Should you train the same way to get stronger or bigger? So that was my original question. Well, if you are a big, let, let's look at a beginner first. Okay, a beginner, the training should be the same regardless of your goal. Okay, uh, if you're a beginner, you need to achieve several things you have several priorities first you learn to you need to learn to lift properly and i'm not talking about lifting properly on machines that's the one big mistake i see coaches making with beginners you are a beginner i'm going to stick to machine exercises we're going to get to the big lifts after no you need to learn those bigger lifts when you're not strong yet because you will need to learn proper form and if you use less weight 
because you're not as strong, there's much less risk of suffering an injury. It's much, actually much safer to learn the right lifting technique on the big basic lift, squat, deadlift, uh, Romanian deadlift, bench press, overhead press, whatever, rowing, chin-ups. It's much better, much safer to learn the proper mechanics, proper lifting technique on those movements while you are a beginner than when you have a lot of experience training with machines and stuff like that because your muscles will be stronger than your movement capacity. And also, when you are a beginner, you will progress pretty much regardless of how much actual load you're using in the gym. So there's much less burden to overload when trying to achieve gains when you are a beginner. So you can actually focus on the quality of movement instead of trying to focus on adding weight every time you lift, okay? So learning to lift properly, mastering the big basics. These are the two first things a beginner should do. Build some muscle, which will come anyway, because if you're a beginner and you train well, you, you, you do the right amount of volume, the right amount of exercise, and you, you are focused on your workout and you're eating properly, you will pretty much gain the same amount of muscle regardless of what you do. That is the benefit, but also the curse of being a beginner. Why I say a curse? Because, well, I, you can actually gain muscle rapidly as a beginner regardless of what you do. So it's easy then to assume that what you did as a beginner will keep on working for the rest of your life and you never actually learn to progress in your in your workouts and then you need to gain some strength which will also come simply by doing the exercises so a true beginner uh when you look at the way they are they they have a very high trainability they start from such a low point that any kind of training stimulus will trigger growth in strength and size so they actually don't need any special program they should not train like someone who trains purely for strength like a pure bodybuilding program they should not train like a powerlifter either they just need to do work in the six to ten rep range or six to twelve rep range on a few big basic lift three days a week and they will progress uh they have poor neuromuscular control uh, so they will have poor mind muscle connection they have lousy fiber recruitment bad firing rate and and their intra and intramuscular coordination sucks, which is a good thing because it means it will improve rapidly. It also means that they need to train those big basic movements more often because they were the number one priority is improving how efficient their brain is at utilizing the muscle they have. They are a very sensitive protective mechanism. So once again, the more often they can lift on the, those big lifts, the more rapidly they can make those protective mechanisms less sensitive, less conservative. They have poor work capacity. They, they, it takes them a longer time to recover, and they can't do a lot of volume in a session without crashing down. So when you look at beginners, they will not be good at lifting maximum weight because their nervous system is not efficient. And, and as a coach, I've seen tons of beginner being almost the same strength for an 8RM, like the way they can lift for 8 reps, as they are with a 1 or 2RM. They will bench press like, 150 pounds for eight reps and 160 for one rep. That's because they have very low neuromuscular, uh, neurological capacities. So training for strength is actually very inefficient because they will not use that much more weight for low reps as they would with higher reps. So the growth they get is much lower. Uh, they will not be able to lift maximum weight safely, and at least not until they have mastered proper technique. They will build muscle mass without having to use any special program, 10,000 exercise, special method, or magical routine. That's the good thing about being a beginner. It's a great time to focus on becoming good at the basics because the, the basics will work as well as any special routine will for a beginner. Uh, they cannot perform a lot of exercises in a session. First, because they, they don't have good work capacity, but also because their neurological capacities are not good. Doing an exercise they've never done before or they, they are not good at takes a lot more out of them and creates a lot more training stress. So that's why beginners, uh, after three or four exercises, the if they continue doing more, the quality of their workout will suffer badly, and that's when they can get injured, and that's also what limits their growth. Beginner can can grow very easily, but they can actually miss out on those beginner gains by trying to do too much. They will not recover well from high volume work, as I mentioned, and they do require more recovery days. That's why I think that an every other day 
training approach is really good for beginners or three days a week. So simply put, they will not respond well to a typical strength program, nor will they respond well to a typical bodybuilding hypertrophy training program. So they need to stick to doing four, maybe five like big lifts, basic lifts, three days a week. Whole body training, uh, two, or, two to four sets of six to 10 reps. To me, that's the best way to train for a beginner. It's not sexy, but it will work. And gradually focus on, on getting gr gradually stronger in that range. Now, I like to use the double progression model with beginners, meaning that I don't tell them to do three sets of six. I do tell them to do three sets of six to 10, and they only add weight once they can do all of their work sets with the same weight at the top of the range. So let's say I'm, I'm telling you, you need to do three sets of six to 10. You use 100 pounds. Well, until you can get three sets of 10 with 100 pounds, you cannot add weight. And, and when you can do that, you add five pounds to the bar or five to 10 pounds. And you don't need to change exercises until you stop progressing on a movement for more than two weeks, okay? So very simple, whole body training, I would actually use the exact same exercises on all three days because beginners just need to repeat those basic movement patterns more often to improve neurological efficiency as fast as possible. That will work great and there's no nothing special there, but it's much better to do that than trying to do anything, any cute uh, routine you read on mag in magazines or, or on the internet. Now, the further away you get from being a beginner, the more advanced you are, the more your training will be will need to be tailored or specific to your main goal. So that's when the differences between training for strength and size comes in. The more advanced you are, the more you will need to make a choice. Do, want, do I want maximum strength? Understanding that you might not get as much muscle size as you want. Do I want to focus on maximum growth? understanding that I might not get the maximum strength I, I, I would want. Or do I decide, well, you know what? I'm going to use a middle-of-the-road approach. I'm going to get pretty good gains in the strength, pretty good gains in hypertrophy. It will not be maximum in, in either of them, but it will be pretty good. So that's when you need to make your choice. Personally, what I like to do, and that requires a bit more work, but, but that's what will give you closest to achieving maximum gains in both. And it's called periodization because understand that even though the methods to get maximum strength are different than the methods to use when to get maximum size, increasing muscle mass will help you get stronger because the bigger the muscle, the greater the strength potential once you develop those new, the, the neurological factors. And the same thing is true for strength. The more muscle you have, the stronger you can become potentially. And by being stronger, you can also get bigger more easily by uh, being able to use more weight on your hypertrophy methods. So for, for me, if I'm a bodybuilder, if I want maximum hypertrophy, getting stronger is a tool. If I want to get stronger, if I'm a powerlifter, getting bigger is a tool. So the periodization works this way, okay? And that's linear periodization, and, and it, it works. I know that a lot of people are talking about that, against that. For powerlifting, it might not be optimal, but if you are... Uh, if you want both, getting stronger and bigger, a linear periodization can work very, very, very well until you get to the very, very, very advanced level. So if your goal is to get stronger, that's your main priority. You still want to get bigger, but strength is your ultimate goal. The, your four training phases lasting four to six weeks each will be as follows. Block number, number one will be size focus one or two. I will get to the phases in about two minutes, uh, probably more like 10. Block two will be a strength and size hybrid, working on both at the same time, which is the middle of the road approach. Block three will focus on strength development, building maximum strength. And block number four will be a max strength block, learning to demonstrate strength as well as you can, or using the, the full potential of your muscles. And each phase would be four to six weeks in length. If your goal is to get as big and muscular as possible, you, but you still want to get some strength, the periodization will actually be reversed. Basically, the closer you get to the end of your training cycle, 
the more specific to your main goal the trading should be. The further away you are from the end of the cycle to the closer you are to the beginning of the cycle, the more general or foundational your trading is. So if I'm trading for strength, hypertrophy work is general, strength is specific. If I'm trading for hypertrophy, hypertrophy work is specific and strength work is general. So if my goal is maximum hypertrophy, my first block will be maximum strength development. So it will not be a max strength, it will be a strength development. So it will be set of four to six reps, for example, to build strength while still getting some muscle growth. Second block will be the combination, the hybrid of strength and size. Block three will be a size focused one. Size focused one is focused more on volume. And then block four will be size focused two, which is focused more on intensiveness. So that's the periodization I use when I want to maximize gains. Now, if you are someone, for example, and all you want is getting bigger, you don't care about getting stronger, you could simply do the size focus blocks one or two. If you want to get stronger and you actually don't want to get bigger, like if you play in a, if you're in a sport where your body weight is important, then you might stick to only strength training. And if you want just, I don't want a, a complicated training you could, and I want, I still want both. You could still do just the uh, strength and size hybrid block and just over and over and over again. That will work. But to me, the best results will be achieved with a paradise approach like this. It's also the approach that will uh, prevent injuries the best and will give you longer time progression. So if you look at all of these individual blocks, size focus one is volume dominant. As I mentioned earlier, you can have high volume or you can have high intensiveness pushing each set to failure or beyond, but you should not do both in the same workout. Okay. That will, for most, it will be an excess, especially natural lifters. It will be excessive training stress. So you will hit each muscle twice a week, which is optimal in my opinion for hypertrophy. So a good split would be an upper lower split, uh, or doing, uh, push muscles plus squat on one day and pull muscle plus hamstring on another day. Uh, you could do, uh, peg biceps. Uh, legs, back triceps, delts, and rear delts. And you would probably have to do one more uh, leg exercise on one of these days, just as to make sure that you do in the legs twice a week. I recommend for a volume approach, eight to 12 reps per set. Uh, staying two, maybe three reps in reserve. Like you don't get close to failure when you use a volume approach. Uh, you do three to five sets per exercise. I like to use a paradise approach once again. So for example, if my block is four weeks long, the first week is three sets per exercise. Second is four, third is five. And then we have a deload with two work sets per exercise on week number four. For example, always follow a very, very, very high volume week with a very low volume week just to allow yourself to recover and avoid chronically elevated cortisol levels. Uh, you will use roughly an equal amount of multi-joint movements uh, and intermediate exercises. So we, you do like one or two big barbell lifts and then the rest will be machine, pulleys, isolation work. Uh, five to six exercises per workout divided over all the muscles being trained. So if you use an upper lower approach, uh, you will probably have, you will have, uh, let's say, uh, six exercises spread over three muscles or so two exercises per muscle, for example. Uh, you will use moderate rest intervals, almost complete rest between set 90 to 120 seconds. So that would be your volume dominant workouts. Size focus two. Size focus two focuses on intensiveness, pushing each set to the limit to muscle failure or even beyond. Okay. So of course it will come with a lower volume of work because you cannot have high volume and high intensiveness at the same time. Once again, still hitting each muscle twice a week optimally. You can have more than 12 reps per muscle uh, per, per set. In that case, it will come from an intensification method. Drop sets, rest pause, mechanical drop sets, supersets. By the way, I personally see a superset for the same muscle as one set. So if I'm doing a set of bench press and pec deck, I count that as one set, not two sets. Because if there's no rest, it's one bout of exercise. I will use one to three sets per exercise. Okay, normally, if I'm using uh, uh, if I'm using low intensification method, 
I, I will use one. Uh, uh, sorry, if I'm using an, an intensification method like drop set, super set, rest pause, I will only use one work set. I can use two sets before that, which are not push hard, just to get used to the weight. But there's one all out crazy, crazy work set. If I'm just going to muscle failure, so I go to failure, but I don't have an intensification method, there will be two work sets. And if I stop one rep short of failure or close with like a, an RP of nine, I can do three sets, okay? So it's always a relationship between volume and intensiveness. There will be one major lift, big compound movement per session. The rest would be more like machine, pulleys, isolation work. High intensiveness work is best done on less dangerous exercises. Because if you go to true failure and, and beyond, on a squat or a deadlift, the chance of injury is much higher than doing a, than on a leg press. Um, if I'm using the volume approach, I like you those big compound movements. And I still want to keep at least one of them in my workout. But just to minimize the risk of injuries, I will use more minor or, or less demanding exercises, allowing me to more easily go to failure. Anyway, four to five exercises per workout. So there are less exercises than the volume approach, of course. Uh, as I mentioned, to me, if I do two supersets, a superset of two exercises, I actually count that as one exercise, but just don't get crazy about that. If you do, I'm only doing three exercises, but you're doing four, uh, I'm only doing three, four exercises, but you're doing four giant sets in your workout. That will be too much. I have some common sense here. And I will use shorter rest intervals because my goal is to create as much fatigue, as much growth factor accumulation, as much lactate accumulation as possible. Uh, in the work I'm doing. So shorter rest intervals will allow me to get to failure more easily and accumulate that lactate more easily because I'm not getting it all out after a set. Strength and size hybrid. If I want to work both on strength and size at the same time, you have two options, a concurrent approach and a conjugated approach. Concurrent approach means that in each workout, you will use both strength and size work. So if I'm using a concurrent approach and a conjugated would be I'm doing, let's say, half my workouts for strength and half my workouts for size. So concurrent approach, I will combine fairly heavy work. So that's four to six reps. So it's not maximum strength work, but it's heavy enough to get those neurological factor improvements. Uh, so a mix of fairly heavy, so one basic lift per session, and then hypertrophy work. Uh, you can use an upper lower or a lift specific approach. I like the lift specific approach for strength and size hybrid. So for example, I would have a bench press workout where my main lift is the bench press. Then I pick my assistance work to improve the bench press. Then I would have a squat workout plus the assistance work for a squat and so on and so forth. So bench, squat, overhead press, and deadlift, for example. You can pick different lifts if, if that floats your boat, but that's a pretty solid approach. Uh, so four to six reps for the big basic lift and six to 10 on the assistance work. See, it's still slanted a bit more towards strength while still being in the ideal hypertrophy zone. Three to five sets for the big lift, two to three sets for the assistance work. Of course, that is work sets. Uh, four to five exercises per workout. So that would be one big lift and three to four assistance exercise. Normally, I would have one big lift, two main assistance exercise, which could be multi-joint movements on machines, for example. And then I would have two isolation exercise for the muscles I want to develop the most in that movement. I would use longer rest intervals for the big lift, three to four minutes to maximize performance because I want to lift heavier and two to three minutes for the assistance work. If I use the conjugated approach, what I would do is train four workout four days a week using an upper lower split. That, that's the best one. Uh, two of those workouts, so one for each, one lower, one upper, would be for strength. So two or three, three to four exercises, three to five sets per exercise, four to six reps per set. And two of those workouts, so one upper workout, upper upper body, one lower body workout, would be size focused workouts. Either size one, the volume approach, or uh, size focus too, which is the intensiveness approach, depending on what you like to do, okay? So that would be the conjugated approach. Personally, uh, I feel that the conjugated approach is likely less traumatic on the body, but most people prefer doing the conjugated approach when it comes to feeling those or being motivated by the workouts.
both work pretty much equally. By the way, sorry, I have a pretty drastic cold. Uh, it's probably not COVID-19, but if you don't see any videos following this one, well, it probably was. But I just think it's a, it's a regular cold. So sorry about the disagreement. All right. Strength development. So the block where you want to build your strength potential. You focus on heavier weights, but not maximal weight. You will hit each muscle or more importantly, movement pattern two or three times a week. That's where I like the whole body approach uh, using either like heavy, light, medium workout, which is the traditional whole body approach. Or we can use like what I do with my Omni Contraction training system. I have one workout where I emphasize the eccentric, one workout where I add isometric pauses during the lift, and one workout that is just regular lifting. I like four workouts per week, so three whole body sessions. And the fourth one would be a gap workout. The gap workout is where you use isolation exercises to work on muscles that might have been neglected by the big sessions. So in your big session, you only have three or four exercises because you're lifting heavy, right? So it could be, it's going to be big, basic movement. If you want to cover the whole body, it's going to be a squat, a push, a pull, and a hip hinge, okay? Uh, so there's no room for assistance and isolation work in that routine. That's going to burn you out. So you have a fourth workout where you might work on muscles that you felt were neglected or are weak points. And in those workouts, you would use strictly bodybuilding or hypertrophy methods. So that for the, for the main workout, it's three to five reps per set. Uh, and eight to 12 for the gap workout, traditional hypertrophy work. Uh, it's four to six sets per exercise for the big sessions. Two to three for the gap workouts. It's three to four exercises for the main session. Four to six for the gap workout. And you would, of course, use longer rest intervals for the heavy work, three to four minutes. Finally, the last type of block we can have, and of course, now that you know how to build those blocks, you just refer back to the periodization schedule I mentioned earlier to build your training cycle. Uh, maximum strength, focus on heaviest weight, so maximum weight, in each muscle or movement pattern two or three times a week. Same split as strength development, nothing changes. Uh, I also like those four workouts with a gap session. It's one to four reps per set. Of course, for the big lift, the gap workout would go down for, to six to eight reps. Four to six sets per, per big exercise, still two or three for the gap workout. Three or four exercises per session, four to six for the gap session. And we use the longest rest intervals. Because now we are in the maximum weight zone, we can actually rest up to five minutes between sets, at least before there was maximum set. So, so these are the block, the types of training that will, that will work. Personally, I like a paradise approach. But the periodized approach of progressing from block to block is not necessary or not even effective for beginners. As I mentioned, beginners should stick to becoming good at the basics. And, and after about six months on that type of training, they can focus on which goal they want to uh, focus on and build their training cycles accordingly. So... Thanks for watching, guys. I know it was way too long once again. So don't forget to subscribe, like, comment, and also hit the bell thingy to know when I'm producing more video. And if you don't do that, my buddy Andrew will be coming for you and not in a pleasant, sexy way. So until next time, thanks for watching.